Hey, welcome back to 2014. Welcome back to 2014. No, welcome back to the big board. Welcome to 2014. That's what we need to be saying, right? Okay, uh, this is my second attempt at trying to record this video because initially I wasn't really sure what I wanted to share with you, but I think I have a slightly better idea now. So this is the first in uh, of three titles that all focus on the Aspen Estling battle uh, that ran 21, 22 May 1809. And it dovetails nicely into our look at the operational art of warfare that we conducted with the, or the genesis of, or the maturation, maturation of the uh, operational art of warfare uh, that we looked at with the seven days uh, of uh, 1809. So, uh, with that said, my idea here is that we're going to take three titles. This is the Vivictus uh, Jour de Glory uh, series that uh, looks at Napoleonic combat. And we have two other titles we're going to examine that are both also tactical in nature. And we're going to compare and contrast the systems. We're going to compare and contrast how the battle is fought out and turns out with all the different command mechanics and cavalry charges and artillery and how shock combat is run and all that sort of stuff. Am I going to do that in a case-by-case, rule-case versus rule-case basis? No, I'm not. Of course, I'm going to give you the Kev Sharp version of all that, right? Uh, you may or may not be able to follow it. It may or may not make any sense, but I'm going to have a bunch of fun with it and hopefully we'll, we'll come out of all that with a deeper appreciation of tactical combat in the Napoleonic era, given that we've been looking at sort of the strategic maneuver related elements of combat as it pertained to moving from classical combat modes to the operational art of warfare mode, more maneuver oriented, more uh, centers of gravity focused, and Napoleon truly was one of the architects uh, and uh, um, masters of that type of warfare for the period and certainly provided uh, a lot of learning examples with his enormous string of victories. There are all sorts of reasons why he failed uh, uh, at Aspen Asling and Wagram onwards and that a lot has a lot to do with uh, people like the Archduke Charles uh, learning from his mistakes and learning from how uh, the core, how cores could be taken advantage of, how to use artillery more effectively, so to use technology more effectively. And so it's an interesting era to have a look at and there's no reason why we shouldn't spend you know, a fair amount of time uh, looking at all this. And as you know, I've also picked up a copy of uh, uh, the, the Campaigns of Napoleon by Chandler, by David Chandler. I've got that weighty tome next to the next to the board here. We'll be using that as a reference. I will try and write up uh, my thoughts on this specific battle as it pertains to what's in his book and what we see when we play. And I'll also give a little historical preamble before we get get into the meat of this. So. Let's talk about the scale of this game. Each hex is 300 meters for this particular battle, and it seems to me that this is my first title to play in this series. Uh, it seems to me that that can be a fungible uh, number, so uh, 300 meters for this particular title. And the strength points are different from the standard rules in that strength points for each of these units. Uh, for cavalry, uh, that's, and, that's 300 horse. And for the infantry, this is going to be 400 uh, infantry units, infantry men. And the guns stay round about the same, uh, so not a lot of change there. One, you may have noted that there was a black number and a white number. The difference between those two things is that uh, one represents a regimental scale and the other represents a brigade scale. And I forget which is which. Uh, I believe black is... Reg is for brigades and white is for regiments. Uh, we use a, there's a couple of interesting mechanics here for this particular battle to represent how the command and control for the for the French was significantly better than for the Austrians and they do that primarily through 
the use of tying a number of formations to a, one of the marshals, whether it be Lanes, uh, and I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of these names, or Messina, and uh, we can tie uh, up to four formations to each one, and then uh, act when these chits, the chit is pulled out of the chit pull uh, cup, uh, the formation cup, we we then activate four formations versus one, and that can be certainly be handy. Uh, that does mean I think uh, there actually I'm not sure if there's actually two uh, two chits for each leader or not. Where are they? Oh man, I can't seem to find them right at this point. So we'll we'll table that to be organized later. I think they only get one activation a turn, so you you, you the price you pay there is not potentially not receiving the double activation in a in a given turn. Right, so where were we? Let's talk about then, so that's a, so that's an interesting uh, interesting opportunity for the French to make choices about whether they uh, they keep four formations in, three formations in, do they want to have uh, the cavalry here have two activations in a turn, so do they may not want to act uh, uh, tie them to Lanes or Messina, who are you going to tie them to? Lots of choices already in a, what feels like a fairly constrained board, but there seems to be a fairly rich amount of detail we're going to have to deal with in terms of choice matrices. So, uh, victory conditions. French receive VPs for uh, controlling Aspern and Essling, obviously enough. They also receive VPs, if you can see these hexes here, this line here, this trail, and this road section. Uh, units in, that are not routed... Uh, North of the board, north is kind of angling this way. Will receive, will receive uh, VPs for those units, and the Austrians and the French receive VPs for units routed on the board, that's still on the board, or for units killed or units routed off the board. Uh, there are also VPs for capturing this bridge and uh, this hex here, which is the island of uh, Le Beau. Uh, that would mean that we have, you know, isolated and cut off the, the French army. So naturally, there's a, a significant whack of uh, VPs for that. And basically, then, whoever got the mostest wins. Is. That's pretty much how it works. Uh, I think uh, it, there's a margin of error there. So if the, if it's six or less, then you know it's a it's a draw. So really, one side's going to need to pretty much have a crushing victory and potentially six VPs or more, that's either six units destroyed or it's capturing this plus one of these hexes. So that's a pretty significant delta to have to achieve uh, in order to uh, to have a victory versus a draw. All right. So that's kind of the that's kind of the background on everything uh, on, on the on the game's uh, scale per se. We really haven't talked about the mechanics. There are a few things here that I probably a little uh, not confused about, but potentially concerned about in terms of how they may work out. Uh, counter charges, the artillery battery fire, and counter battery fire. We'll see how those all play out at this scale. It's it's hard for me to uh, envision this as a 300 meters per hex game at the moment. Uh, after looking at the other two titles we're going to play, the OSG title, Last Success, and uh, the NBS title, Aspen Essling, which is, uh, I think they're both around the 200 meter mark or 75 meter mark, and uh, uh, I know that the NBS title is 20 minute turn, so very, very different uh, scale here. And well, but let's run with it and see what happens. So that's the that's the the game, the map, and the piece is all ready, all ready for action. It's a beautiful winter day here, and we're going to get cranking on this before we get outside and go have some fun.